voice in the dark, a song that lights up the stars, one breath that gives life, one sovereign in power, who speaks with thunder and fire, one Lord, one King. There is no other that can compare to you. sons. 
his blessed trinity. It's so good to see you this morning. My name is Jason, and I am one of the pastors here at Hope Church, and I'm so glad that you have chosen uh, to be with us this morning as we continue on our series uh, called Essential Playlist. Throughout the summer, we are looking at uh, it, 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 it is a different psalm each week, and we are studying and looking closely and uh, looking at the psalms, and as we look at the psalms, we recognize that the psalms look at us and they speak for us. One of the things that's so unique about, uh, about Scripture is that uh, as we examine Scripture, uh, Scripture examines us. And this morning we get to look at Psalm 113. There's a lot of songs out there with the title Hallelujah. Uh, some of them are uh, deeply religious songs. Some of them are clearly not so much. Uh, some of them are featured in some of the greatest movies of all time involving Shrek. Um, but the thing about hallelujah is it is a, it is a word that, um, that demonstrates praise or exaltation of something. When we come to Psalm 113, we are in a series of about five or six psalms between 113 and 118 that are called the Hallel songs in Hebrew. Basically, the songs that uh, bring about the response of praise or hallelujah. In fact, Psalm 113 and Psalm 114 were both sung uh, primarily before the Passover feast. And so we can assume that when Jesus celebrated the Last Supper with His 12 apostles, that Psalm 113 could have been one of the last two psalms that He sung before He was betrayed and crucified. It is a song of praise and it is a song of worship. And, uh, and uh, it, it teaches us not just uh, how to praise God, but two very big reasons why we ought to praise God. And in fact, uh, we'll put them in, in, in three different categories as we look through this. But uh, let's look at Psalm 113 and uh, why it is so wonderful that we, can, that we can praise God. Listen to these words. Psalm 113 Verse 1, he says, praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord be praised. 
The Lord is high above all nations and His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of His people. He gives the barren woman a home and and making her joyous, making her the joyous mother of children, praise the Lord. Father, we thank you that we can praise you. We look to you and we look to your word. Would you please speak to us in the name of Jesus, our Savior? Amen. In these three, uh, in these, in these handful of verses here, we notice why God is worthy to be praised. And in fact, in, in just such a, a such simple song, uh, two concepts of God, and, and, and though I'll use some big words to explain them, but I'll break them down. But, but basically, something that makes God unique and makes God worthy to be praised among all other things in all creation is this, that God is above all, but even though He's above all, He is with us in the midst of our challenges. The psalmist talks about, uh, about what many people would refer to as the transcendence of God. That means that God is without limits, but also the fact that He's imminent, meaning that God is with us where we are in the midst of our situation. When he describes God, and when he describes why God is so worthy to be praised, he describes basically three aspects of God, three actions of God. The, the first is this, God is worthy to be praised because God sits on high. Listen to how he words it in, in verse 4. It says, The Lord is high above the heavens and His glory above the heavens. He's high above the nations, His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who is seated on high? God is worthy to be praised because He is, and this is the big word I'm going to use, God is transcendent. That basically means that God transcends every limitation uh, that humans would have. God transcends time. He transcends space. He transcends nations. If any type of limitation that you and I have, God transcends. In fact, listen to how, he wor- listen to how it's worded. It, it says in verse 3, it said, Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time and forevermore. It means that God is to be worshipped and God is to be praised throughout eternity. God transcends time. From the rising of the sun to the, to the setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Wherever the sun rises and wherever it sets, God's name is to be praised. He, he transcends place. God's name, says verse 4, the Lord is high above the heavens, God transcends all the nations. The name of the Lord is above all nations. God is is above all people, above all things, above all time, above all places. God is bigger than anything else in all creation. And that gives me great hope. It lets me know that there is no challenge that is too big for God. There is no situation that God is not in control of. There is nothing that surprises God. Nothing came before God. Nothing will come after God. Nothing will outsmart God. Nothing will overcome God. God transcends everything, which means no matter what is taking place in the world, in your life, in my life, in all of creation, God transcends it that He is bigger than those things. one of the challenges of believing in a transcendent God is if we're not careful, we can believe that God is only transcendent. That He is only bigger than everything. Uh, many of you throughout, throughout history, you've learned, learned about many of our, of our forefathers and about how so many of them were what many people would call deists. Deists are, are, are people that believed in a theology, basically, that God kind of created the world, he wound up the clock, he, he, uh, he put it on autopilot, and then he is, uh, 
He has kind of left the room and is allowing the world to function in a system that he created, but a system that he's not involved in. If we believe that God is transcendent, which we do, but only believe that he's distant and uninvolved, then it doesn't give us any hope. The psalmist here says that God is to be praised, that God sits on high. Not only does God sit on high, we have hope because unlike the deist, we believe that though God sits on high, the second thing is that God looks low. Listen to how he words it. It's in verse, in verse 6, it says, Who looks down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and he lifts the needy from the ash heap. Even though God is transcendent and transcends all our boundaries, even though He's perfect, even though His character transcends ours, even though God is, is infinitely perfect in every way, it says here that from the heavens that He looks down on us. Not that He looks down in, in, in terms of, um, in, 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 in a way of contempt, but God stoops down because He cares for us deeply. The God that transcends is also imminent. And let me tell you what imminent means. Very, very simple. To put it in the, in the, in, in the theology of Luther Vandross, God is here and now. That in the midst of your problems, in the midst of your challenges, even though God sits on high, He's involved with your life and my life. Listen, listen to how the psalmist words it here. It says, he says, verse 6, it says, Who looks down on the heavens and the earth? That, that means that when God looks at the heavens and God looks at the earth, he, 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 he stoops down to do that. That not only shows that God is above the heavens and the earth, but he stoops down because he cares. He gets involved. It says here, it says, he, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. When you and I find ourselves in terrible situations, in, in, in humiliating situations, when we're, when we're tired and weary and worn out and, 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 and filthy situations, when we're covered with dust and ash, one, one, uh, one commentator translated the word ash here as dung. In other words, when you're in the midst of situations as bad as they can be, God is not too far to get involved and to meet you where you're at. One of, one of the early stories we see in Scripture is uh, the story of Abraham and Sarah. God had promised to Abraham that, uh, that he would be a father of many nations. And uh, even though and Abraham had a hard time believing it because Abraham was old and Abraham's wife Sarai was old, and, uh, but God had promised him, and Sarah was well aware that, uh, that God promised both of them a child late in life. Sarah began to question God's timing and God's ability to um, be faithful to that promise. So Sarah had this brilliant idea. She goes to Abraham, and she says, Abraham, God has called you to be a father of many nations, but I don't think I can bear the child. I want you, I want to give my, uh, my maiden uh, Hagar to you, and the child can be conceived with Hagar. Abraham went along with the plan, and, uh, and Hagar conceived a child. Well, it just so happens that once the child was conceived by Hagar, Sarai, Abraham's wife, began to become jealous and get upset and to mistreat Hagar in, in many ways. And so Hagar began to run away, and Hagar went out in the middle of the wilderness to be by herself and to run away from Abraham the father of the child, and Sarai. As she was out there, it says that the angel of the Lord came to her. 
And the angel of the Lord says, Hagar, why are you running away? And, and uh, she says, I'm running away from Sarai, from, my, from, my, uh, fr- from, um, from Sarai who's, who's mistreated me so poorly, who's treated me so poorly, who's mistreated me. And the angel of the Lord basically says, I came out here to find you, and when I found you, I know that you're here and that I know that you're hurting. But that, uh, that God has heard you. And that the child that you have will be significant. That God has a plan for your life. And he has a plan for the child's life. And yes, you may have ran away from Abraham. And yes, you may have ran away from Sarai. And yes, you may have tried to run away from your problems. But in the midst of all that running away, God found her in the wilderness and spoke hope and courage to her. We we serve a God that's transcendent, that He's above all, He's beyond all. But we also serve a God that gets in the middle of our lives when we call out to Him. Hagar was running away, and as she was running away, she ran into God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, one of, the, one of the accounts in the Old Testament, they were thrown into the fiery furnace for not, uh, for not bowing down to the, to the false gods. And, and uh, when they did that, they, those that threw them in the furnace looked and said, wait a minute, we're doing the inventory. We put three men into the furnace, and we look in the furnace. There's not just three men there. There's four men there, and one of them appears to be the Son of God. God showed up in the midst of their fiery trial. Here's the thing. If we believe in only a God that's transcendent, that's beyond all, but doesn't get involved in our lives, then then that God in some ways feels like He can't help us. We not only serve a God that transcends all time and space, we serve a God that is here and now. Then in the midst of our challenges, in the midst of our dust, in the midst of our our ash heap, in the midst of our dung heap, in the midst of our running away from problems, in the midst of our trying to get our lives together, in the midst of our COVID-19, in the midst of of, of our unrest, in the midst of our depression, in the midst of whatever we're going through, God shows up. Because God is not only transcendent, but God is here and God is now. God sits on high, but God also looks low. God is is so great because He loves and pursues the ungreat. One of the psalmists says, uh, uh, "Even even even if I make my bed in hell, there you will find me. There, There is no place that you can go to get away from God. God pursues those that belong to Him. No matter how difficult and how far we stray. We're not, God not only sits on high, God not only looks low, but, uh, but we see in this that, um, that God sits high and that uh, God looks low, but... Uh, but more than that, God, God lifts up. He sits high, he looks low, but he lifts up. Verse, uh, verse 7, it says, He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He, he makes them sit with princes and the princes of his people. And he gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of her children. In antiquity, when the Scripture was written, perhaps one of the biggest challenges that anyone could face would be the challenge of of not being able to conceive children. It's a challenge that many people face today. And uh, and in the time of Scripture, it was uh, in many ways even a greater challenge. Children were the uh, 
only way you could be taken care of as you, as you got older. Children were the way that uh, you could, you could um, build, your, um, build your family. Children were the, the, the only way that, uh, that, that you could really have influence. Uh, oftentimes within a community. And, and uh, to not have a child in the Old Testament times was oftentimes considered a curse by many, not by God, but by others. Perhaps that is why throughout Scripture that, the, that so many of the great men and women were conceived in miraculous fashion. We have Abraham and and Sarah, which I began sharing with you about earlier, they had a son when Abraham was a hundred, and the child's name was, uh, was Isaac. Later on, we learn the story of Hannah. When, uh, when, when Hannah was, uh, Hannah was a, a, um, a, a woman that, uh, that simply was tormented, by a rival, because she could not conceive children. Her character was questioned. Her, her love was questioned. The love of, the, of her husband was questioned. She was que- her faithfulness to God, God's love for her, was que- all those things were, were questioned. She cried out to God, and God eventually, God, God eventually gave her a child, gave her the child that she longed for, gave, gave her gave her this miraculous child that, um, that, was a, that she had given back to God. And in that, she begins to, uh, to worship God. She, she begins to, to praise God for, for all, that, uh, all that God had done. And, and these are her words in 1 Samuel. I, I'll just read you what he says, what, what, what uh, she says. When she sings to the Lord, she says... Uh, she, she says, the Lord makes poor and makes rich. The Lord brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. And he lifts up the needy from the ash heap and makes them sit with princes and to inherit a seat of honor. For the pillar of the Lord of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. So what happens is Hannah begins to praise God because God has given her this child after everyone else has written her off. And the child, as many of you may be aware, is that the child eventually becomes Samuel, and uh, Samuel becomes a, 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 a priest of the Lord and, and is the one that, uh, that, 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 that does so many great things throughout Israel. And the psalmist here, when he begins to quote God's faithfulness, he's not quoting how kingdoms were were conquered. He's not quoting how the Red Sea was parted. He's not quoting how one miraculous thing after another took place. The psalmist is reaching back and is being reminded about how God looked on the barren Hannah and saw her situation and met her in the midst of her pain, met her in the midst of her challenges and blessed her with a child beyond all all expectations of those around her. And through that, God had, had lifted her up. Remember I told you at the beginning how this is one of the final psalms that Jesus quoted before he was betrayed and crucified. One cannot look at this psalm and, and think of, the, of a miraculous conception without in some ways looking forward to Jesus without looking to the fact that one day someone named Mary would conceive a child by the Holy Spirit. And this virgin would give birth to Jesus who would live a sinless life and die 
a death on behalf of you and me. Because the God that sits high looks low and He lifts up. And the way that He gets involved is by sending His own Son to live and to die in the midst of the world and challenges that are similar that you and I live in. God is not a God that simply looks on from afar and tells us to get our stuff together. God is not a God that looks on from afar and uh, watches us struggle without caring. God is a God that is bigger than any challenge, any problem, any situation, anything that you can imagine, but He's also a God that actively gets involved in your life and my life. And the biggest and the greatest example of that is when He sent Jesus through Mary to live a sinless life and die as sinner's death so that you and I could be forgiven. I'm thankful that God transcends all time, space, places, nationalities. God transcends all those things. But I'm just as thankful that God gets involved in your life and mine. And He doesn't leave us where we're at. But as the psalmist says, that he lifts us up through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Father, we're grateful that Christ is beyond all and above all and separate from all. But we're thankful that he's here and he's here now. And Father, just as... Um, the angel of the Lord found Hagar in the wilderness. Just as uh, is the three men in the furnace were found by the one appearing to be the Son of God. Just as um, the woman at the well was found by Jesus. Just as Abraham in the wilderness was found uh, by you at the burning bush. So you pursue us and find us in the midst of our mess, not to condemn us, but to restore us and redeem us. And Father, I thank you for that. For Jesus that, uh, that has done that for us. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. So I want to thank you again for, uh, for being with us this morning. Just want to share with you a couple of things taking place uh, in the life of Hope Church. The first is uh, that you, uh, if you've not completed our connection card, I'd ask you to do that. At the bottom of your screen, you'll find a link. Uh, that you can go to and fill out your connection card. That's just our way of being able to connect with you, your way of being able to connect with us, uh, just so that we can know how we are best able to serve you. I want to know also that you, uh, that you can visit our website at hopeindayton.org. While you're there, uh, you can uh, go to our giving page for your tithes and your offerings. You could also do that through your text to give and uh, through mailing to our address here uh, at 5980 Wilmington Pike. If you live here in the Dayton area, we'd love to be able to connect with you. Really, we'd love to be able to connect with you no matter where you are. Uh, but you can email me at uh, jasonhopeanddayton.org. Um, we'll be gathering again uh, not too long. And I would love to see you here at our campus uh, on Wilmington Pike. I also want to uh, let you know that we have a special event coming up that I'm really excited about. Uh, next Sunday is Scholarship Sunday. And uh, I'm really excited to share a little bit about that with you. We're so excited about the scholarship ministry and giving here that has taken place over the last a number of years. Uh, each year, many students go to, uh, go to college and grad school 
uh, and they do so partially because of the faithfulness of those uh, here at Hope Church, uh, sowing and investing uh, into their education and into their future. I'm going to uh, introduce you to John Ward, who chairs our Legacy Foundation. He's going to share with you a little bit about the uh, scholarship uh, ministry in general, and then, I'm gonna share, and then you'll, you'll meet Molly Bebko. And uh, Molly is one of the scholarship recipients and, uh, and is a student of Bowling Green, and you'll, get to hear your, you'll be able to hear her story. So uh, let's turn our attention to both John and Molly at this time. Good morning, church. My name is John Ward. Before the pandemic, you could always see me in row seven, house left. Next Sunday, we will have a picnic at Hope and an online service to honor those who have graduated from high school or college. And we will also pass out our annual scholarships. Once again, we have an extraordinary group of scholarship recipients who are working hard to prepare themselves for the world. Many of these students you see serving on Sunday morning or throughout the week. Good morning. My name is Molly, and I'm going to be a senior at Bowling Green State University studying to become a speech-language pathologist. Hope has been an integral part of my faith formation over the past 20 years that my family and I have attended. I remember receiving my very first Bible in the first grade, and I also remember receiving the Bible that I still use today, one that has sermon notes and scripture and highlights and all sorts of little reminders of how God has continued to pursue me as I've grown into a young adult. As I have um, looked back on my time at being at Hope, I remember giving my life to Christ as a preschooler and coming every week with this childlike faith, just overcome by wonder in our great God. And I also remember coming into my teenage years and being faced with crises of faith and seeing how much that the world is broken and wrestling with God through that. And I remember that hope was always such a solace, the building and the people, and knowing that I always had a rock-solid relationship with these people who had every Sunday come and approach the throne of God. It was so beautiful and such a gentle reminder of how God's presence never leaves us and how he continues to pursue us as we pursue him right back. As I have gone to Bowling Green, I joined a faith community called H2O, and it has been a really, really beautiful place for me to fall in love with scripture and to see how God continues to pursue my heart and to reveal his character to me through the pages of his word. And I am so, so thankful that I get to continue having a faith community that so resembles what I have here at Hope. And with the gift of this scholarship, I'm so excited to continue pursuing God and also to share how God has given me a deeper joy with all of the students on campus and all of the people in my new small groups and my new areas of ministry. Thanks for Molly. The church really appreciates all you do for us. Next week, we will be passing out scholarships to those that are going on to higher education. These scholarships are possible because of the generous giving of those who attend HOPE and also by those who have specified scholarships in their estate giving. We encourage you to stand alongside these kids as they transition to a world of independence. It is our hope that by supporting these students, they will truly know that they are never truly independent that they will always have the love of God and the love of their church family. We have distributed over $15,000 in scholarships in the last three years. If you want us to continue to fund scholarships, it is up to you. If you feel led to support these young Christians, there are several ways. Next week, we will be taking up a special offering during the picnic. Just specify on your envelope or the check scholarships. You can also give online by using the scholarship line on the giving portal. Thank you for all you do, Hope Church. So, so as you can see from, that, uh, from John and Molly, our scholarship ministry here is impacting not only students now, but students in the future. We would love for you to be able to participate in that. We're going to have a big celebration uh, next Sunday, celebrating our graduates and our scholarship recipients. We would love to have you participate both by your presence uh, and by your giving. Uh, just, and just like the rest of uh, your, your, the other ways to give, you can give through our website. Uh, you, there's a link there for scholarship. You can also give through text to give and then, of course, through writing 
a, a check uh, or cash here. But anyways, we would love to have you next week at our, ce our celebration. We get to celebrate these great graduates, these great scholarship recipients. And we want to invest in uh, this next generation uh, the same way that others have invested in us. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday. Uh, God bless.